Lecture 4, Module 2, Measure Stage, Part 1, Measurement Systems Analysis. In this module, we'll define the measurement system. We'll talk about measurement system analysis, MSA, and that includes accuracy and precision, gauge bias and linearity, <coughs> the gauge R&R, &R, and we'll discuss the difference between continuous gauge R&R, &R, and we'll talk briefly about attribute gauge R&R. &R. Now, as we saw in previous slides, the variation in the inputs overall affect the process variation for our outputs. So we'd like to be able to control these. In order to control them, we have to be able to measure them. We need to measure these sources of variation so we can work on reducing them. The ones that are causing the most variation in the uh, output of our process, we, if we can reduce their variation, uh, technically we should be able to reduce the variation in the output. So as seen in the previous slide, variation is additive. The overall variation in a system or process is the sum of all sources of variation. So the variance of the process is equal to the variance of the, from the manpower, the variance caused by the machines, the variance coming from our methods, the variance coming in on our raw materials, the variance coming from our measurements, and the variance provided by dear Mother Nature. Unfortunately, one of the sources of process variation is the measurement systems themselves that we use to measure the process validation. Most of us take a, a result from the laboratory or some instrument that we've at face value and never question how, how much uh, variation is being provided by that, uh, by that number. We take them straight. Uh, they are not. There are three characteristics that contribute to the effectiveness of a measurement, <coughs> measurement system. Accuracy or the bias. And this includes the linearity of the bias that changes over the range of the uh, measurement system. And two aspects of precision, which are repeatability and reproducibility. Accuracy and precision. Accuracy is measured as a distance of the mean of the measurement data that we've taken from some known reference, reference value. And this is also known as the bias, as we talked about. So here you see a reference value on the left, that line. And then we have measurement data, which we've averaged and taken a standard deviation and plotted the probability density. And you see the average there is a line, and the line doesn't coincide with the reference value. So it's off. It's off to the right. So there's a positive bias on that. We also see that we uh, have calculated the standard deviation and plotted the, uh, the, the curve there. And the precision is measured as the spread, the variation of the measurement data. Linearity is simply determined by the slope of the line, y equals ax plus b, from our old uh, algebra days, of the response of the measurement system to an increase in the analyte, and that's either a product that you're measuring or a part you may me be measuring, anything you might be measuring uh, that, that you have measured. Calibration. Before using any measure measurement device, it must be calibrated. What do we mean by calibration? That's the act of checking and adjusting, if necessary, the response or output of an instrument used in measurements against the reference standard. Depending on the stability or criticality of the measurement system, uh, this may be done monthly, weekly, daily, just before use. And in some cases, I've seen instruments that I use that, are, that only need to be calibrated on a yearly basis. The most uh, common one that meet people run into early on is a pH meter. should be done uh, uh, probably uh, uh, every day. Uh, and you, you buff, buffer it in with a, with a 7 and a 10 or a 7 and a 4 or something like that, and you make your adjustments. Uh, also, uh, calibrating a, a analytical balance is a very, very common thing, usually done on a daily basis. Very easy to do. Verification is the act of checking the response or output of an instrument used in measurements against the reference standard. So the reference standard is given to the machine and checked to make sure it's giving the appropriate output. And it, but, it, but, but there's no adjustments made. It needs to be plus or minus within a certain range, and that as long as it's within that, we consider it to be fine and, and suitable for use. And this is typically done before, the, before each use or, or analysis that's being performed. A gauge linearity bi and bias study is conducted on samples that cover the operating range of the gauge. So if you want to measure from a low of 90 all the way up to 110, then you, you would run those, uh, uh, those reference standards uh, or samples from the, from, uh, within those range. For each sample, multiple measurements are made, and the average of the measurements is compared to the reference values. A gauge linearity and bias study uses the average of the measurements and the reference values to assess bias and linearity. Bias tells you how accurate your gauge is compared to the reference value, and the line linearity tells you how accurate your gauge is through the expected range of your measurements. And there really should be no linearity or little linearity to the bias. So this looks, it looks something like this. Here we see the bias there with the green line is on zero. And as we go from the low end of the gauge range to the high end, there's no change. 
Uh, and the red line shows that at the low end of the gauge ring, there's a negative bias, and, uh, and at, at the high end, uh, there's a positive bias. Now, that could be the other way around, or it could be st uh, staged up or lower. Uh, it, it doesn't really uh, have to follow that line exactly. As long as, it's, as long as it's not a flat, straight line, there's some kind of uh, linearity issue. Now, linearity may be caused by the gauge just not calibrated. The gauge may not be calibrated correctly at both ends of its operating range. It may, there may have been an error uh, in the performance of the calibration on, on one end, uh, causing a bias to, to change as, as you go up the range. There is an error in one of the standards used. So one of the standards may be bad, giving you a bad output. And the gauge could be worn out. This is very typical on things with moving parts. Uh, it, maybe there's a lot of measurements at one end of the range, so the gears are worn out uh, on, on the instrument so that uh, you, you get inaccurate biased uh, results at, the, at that range. But if you go to another range, you may get much better results. So you'll see some linearity there. And, or there may just be inherent design flaws in the gauge itself. It may have inherent inaccuracies uh, at certain uh, parts of the range. And you need to know what, what ends of the range are good and which ends of the range are bad. Now here's a, 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 an output from Minitab showing a gauge linear bias study for a balance calibration. Uh, in this uh, graph on the, on the left, you can see that the, the reference values uh, in the, uh, uh, the x-axis uh, is 10, 20, and 50 were, were measured. All right? And uh, <coughs> you, you see the graph here. We uh, have looked at the gauge linearity, and the R square is 0. It's a straight line. Okay? Now the gauge linearity is measured by the R square. Uh, that, uh, that number there, R square zero. Uh, it's also known as the coefficient of de uh, determination. And this is really a measure of how well the X values actually predict the Y values. Do they, are they spot on or are they plus or minus something? And R square of 100% means the X is perfectly predicted Ys and a perfect linear relationship exists. Here there is no linear relationship at all. Now the bias data is very low. The average is actually 0 0.00005 grams. A uh, very very tiny little bias, uh, see. but this graph seems to look terrible. It doesn't. Uh, the line is above the zero. We're saying there's no bias, but there is a slight bias. Uh, but the graph looks bad. Why is that? Well, Minitab automatically sets the scale of the y-axis based on the range of the data, so it, ex it expands it out so you can see the data better. So the data looks like it's all, all spread out. Well, this looks a lot better. Well, we just by adjusting the scale of the y-axis by a factor of 10 really can make the results look a whole hell of a lot better. So this looks like, oh, this is a very, very good uh, output here. Uh, we have a very nice uh, response, and uh, you know everyone would look at that and say, that looks great. Uh, the other graph is just as good. Uh, you have to study it for a few minutes to, to realize what it's saying to you. So pay attention to the scale values uh, when you look at uh, graphs. Uh, they can be presented so that they look a lot better than they are. Uh, you, have to, you have to watch what people are doing when they, uh, uh, when they describe stuff for you. So look at the graphs, but then also look at the data, uh, the statistical data that's, prevent, that's presented. Here's a gauge linearity and bias problem. There is a definite positive bias to this data, 0.05 grams. All of these reference values are off by something. All right, so on average, they're about 0.05, uh, 0.056 for 10, 0.051 or 2 for 20, and 0.048 for 50. All right. There's also a slight negative linearity to the bias. So the R square is 18%, uh, some little bit of linearity there. It means it's decreasing as the weight is going up. Now here's another interesting uh, uh, linearity problem. Notice the R square, 94.4%. There's a strong positive linearity to this data. Well, maybe. Uh, really, the, t the 10 gram and the 10 20 gram standards were fine. There seems to be a big problem with the 50 gram weight that just appears to be causing that linearity. Uh, just because Minitab can, can draw a line between these three points, and, and get a nice R square, you still need to look at the statistics and the graph to see what's going on. Here, I would immediately assume that, they, that there's something wrong with one of the, uh, the, the standards, that this graph is not, uh, is not correct. Uh, the 50, 50 gram standard may have been dropped and lost some weight, had a chip off of it or something like that, so it's biased low, and that's what's screwing up the, uh, the graph here. So I would uh, rerun this whole thing uh, with new standards. So where does the variation in the data come from? We saw that we could probably find some, some, some hints uh, in, in the graphs uh, that we just saw. 
Now, uh, when we're measuring something, the variations are coming from the variations in the product itself. Not all products are made equal. So assays will change from batch to batch, tablet to tablet, product to product. The variations in the measurement of the products. Each time you measure it, you're not going to get the exact same number. So that's uh, equal to the, the total variance is really equal to the variance coming from the product and the variance coming from the measurement system. Now the gauge R and R is a study to measure the measurement error in measurement systems. I'll say that again. Gauge R and R is a study to measure the measurement error in measurement systems. That's what it's all about. Repeatability, which is the first R, gauge R and R is the variation in measurements obtained when one person measures the same unit with the same measuring equipment, meaning all things are the same, the only thing moving around really would be coming from the instrument itself. Reproducibility is the variation in average measurements obtained when two or more people measure the same parts or, or items using the same measurement equipment. So the, so the, uh, the only thing changing, the, the product is the same, the, the instrument is the same, the operator is, is different. Can they reproduce e them themselves? Can they re reproduce each other's results? So that's the second R. So there are two components uh, of, uh, of measurement. The gauge variation itself, what's happening with the gauge or the instrument, repeatability. And then the operator variation, uh, what's happening with the operators, between operators, the reproducibility. So now the, uh, uh, the measurement system can be broken down into two parts. The variance of the measurement system is equal to the variance from the repeatability and the variance from the reproducibility. So now the equation becomes the total variability in the product is from the product itself, the repeatability, and the reproducibility. So knowing that, can we tell which one is causing the variation? Well, let's look at a gauge R and R. We will run a gauge R and R. We'll run six runs of different products. We'll use three analysts, our favorite Mohs, Larry, and Curleys, and we'll do three measurements for each analyst for each product, which is a, st a standard simple uh, gauge r r with 27 results total. Now, can we tell where any variation is coming from? Will we be able to figure this out? So let's look at the output you would get from a mini tab uh, run. Up in the upper left hand uh, corner, we, we see the, the components of variation chart. And you see uh, in the bottom it says gauge R and R, uh, repeat, reproducibility, part to part. So the part to part is the variability coming from the products. Notice that the green there, percent of study variance, is very, very low. And the contribution, you can barely see it. So there's not much coming from the products. Here we see the analysts, reproducibility. This is the variation coming from the analysts. And then here's the variation coming from the measurement system. On the right, we see <coughs> the assay data by lot number. As you can see, there's little variation from product to product. There doesn't seem to be much happening uh, with the product. There's almost a straight line there with the exception of, of lot three going up a little bit. Uh, probably be a straight line uh, without, without that. Uh, you notice that the variability of the measurements is quite wide. All right, there's quite a spread between the low values and the high values uh, for lot number one between these three analysts. If we look at the assay data by analyst, we'll see there's very poor precision for Curly. This is the aggregate of all of his data results. And we see that the assay was not changing by much, but Larry, Curly's varies, the values can be all over the place. Larry, on the other hand, is more precise. He gets very much the same results, uh, not as maybe a half as much variation as we see with Curly. And then Mo, we see much tighter, his is much more precise, but there's a definite bias. And I, I believe he would be biased here because this should be, as you see, the, uh, the, the axis is, is 510, 500, 490. These are 500 milligram tablets. And uh, everyone's getting around 500 except for Mo is getting 490. So it looks like he has a definite negative bias there. But he's precise. Now we look at the analyst's, uh, lot, uh, lot, analyst interaction by lot number. Now the operator's results do not agree, right? The numbers do not line up with each other, right? So if you look at lot number one, uh, the black dot curly is above Larry, and Larry and Curly are both way above Mo. Uh, we also notice that there's something funny happening with lot three uh, for uh, for Curly. Uh, the, his his data point was much higher uh, than all the other ones, which might explain why 
uh, the, uh, the the assay uh, was bumped up. The assay data by lot number, the uh, the one the, the one graph on the top, uh, that was where the line moved up a little bit from the other ones. If we go back up and look at that graph, maybe that data point explains that. And you'll see there's a data point way up at the top uh, for, uh, for lot number three, which is probably one of Curly's data points. Now we look at the X-bar chart by analyst, we'll see that most of the operator's res results fall within the variation of the instrument. You really can't tell the difference. And what I mean by the variation of the instrument, that's the lower and upper control limits. So you see the X-bar and the upper and control limits, that's the variation for the instrument itself. And Larry's data is buried. Look at the, the center one, Larry. All of his data is within the control limits. You cannot tell the difference between his data and the variation in the instrument. Curly, there's only one data point, number three, that's outside. The rest of his data is buried within the variation. And uh, Mo, uh, some of his data is, most of his data is outside on the low end. So we really can't tell the difference between uh, one, one data point versus another data point and the variation in the instrument. So can we see where the problems with variability are? Can we hunt it down? I can tell you right now there was a problem with lot three. And, and uh, Curly needs to uh, uh, go over that again and maybe test that again. We also need to know why Mo is biased. And matter of fact, we'd like to also ask him how does he get such tight precision because Curly could probably take some lessons from him. A lot of information is packed into this slide. Now, where are the problems of variability here? Are there problems of variability here? What do we see here? Analysts, the reproducibility, flat line can't see anything there's no variability from the from the analysts a little bit from the measurement system itself and bingo most of the variation is coming from the products we're able to see a lot of movement in the products and that's what we see over here look at the uh, lots number five and six uh, th if you notice that there there are definitely different means for those two data points and if you look carefully the data doesn't overlap at all we can clearly see a, a distinction between the results obtained by all the analysts for five and all the analysts for six. They're very different data sets. So we are measuring differences in the products and not overlapping with each other. Now the assay data uh, by analyst is the aggregate data of all of, of for instance, it's all of Curly's data points. All of Larry's, all of Moe's. They seem to be identical spreads. And the averages are all basically in the same spot. That's good. All right, they should all basically get the same averages, and they should all have pretty much the same reproducibility, which is why uh, that's why it's so low. Look at the operator results agreeing closely. Right, they're right spot on top of each other. All right, Curly, Larry, and Mo, bang, 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 on top of each other. Lot one, lot two, they follow each other exactly. They, if the lot moves, so does all the analyst results. They all vary based on the product itself. And over here with the X-bar chart by analysts, most of the operator's results fall outside the variation of the instrument. You really can detect uh, when something has changed in the product. But we do see some data points uh, inside the control limits, and this has to do with the repeatability issue. Uh, if you saw up in components of variation, we saw that there was some a contribution from the, from the actual instrument itself. Maybe it needs to be better calibrated or tightened up or something, tuned, and that, that may improve the, uh, the performance of that instrument. So this is a very good uh, report here. So let's, let's summarize this. Here we see the components of variation. Most of it is being contributed by, the, by part to part. That is a good thing. The measurements uh, by parts, good by parts, uh, all the data points are, are, all the data is spot on top of each other. The averages are moving all around. Uh, so you're actually watching the movement of the products, not the movement of the variation in the instrument or the variation in the analyst. We look at the measurement by operators. And in this case, instead of dot plots of uh, individual points, we have a box and whisker plots. And if you notice the box and whisker plots look exactly the same and the averages are a straight line across which is what you would expect the parts uh, uh, by operator interaction all the data points are on top of each other that's what it should be the x bar uh, chart by operators in this case uh, in this example uh, you can't even read the uh, the control limits you can't even see them because they're so tight compared to the data this is excellent 
and the R chart, all the data points are within the control limits, that's good. This is a good gauge R and R result. Make note. Now, here we see components of variation, a lot of contribution, not only from the parts, but from reproducibility and repeatability, uh, <coughs> variations coming from a lot of different places. Here we see the measurements uh, you know, by parts. Uh, there's a lot of variation around each one of those data points. Yes, we can see them moving, but there's an awful lot of variation. In fact, they overlap an awful lot. So uh, <coughs> between batch one and two, uh, they probably share uh, the same values uh, uh, for about half of their, their data points. So it could have been, the data could have come, if it could have come from batch one or patch two, you wouldn't know the difference. Again, the measurements uh, by operators. We see the box and whisker plot again. They look differently. The, um, the medians are different from each box. Uh, and, and also, you don't see a straight line going across from, for, the, for the medians. Parts and operators interactions. The, 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 the data points are not on top of each other. They're spread out. They're pulled away from each other. This is not good. Exponent R charts. A lot of the data are within the control limits. Control limits, of course, indicate the variation in the instrument. And if your data your analyst data points are within the variation of the instrument. That means th that you can't tell the difference between your, your output from the, re from the result and, and the output for, or the variation of the instrument itself. And for the R chart, we have at least one data point outside. That's not, not so good. This is bad, and you should take note. This is a good way of uh, comparing your, use these as guides for comparing your own uh, gauge R and R results. All gauge R and R results will look very different from each other. So you have to get used to seeing what are really good ones, really bad ones, and then be able to interpret it, interpret what is in between. Now, when you're looking at measurement systems, uh, there's a, a flow chart that comes right out of Minitab. That's the uh, 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 Minitab Assistant. So if you're looking at continuous data, and your your focus on, is on measurement evaluation, you want to ask whether you're looking at for accuracy. And if you're looking for accuracy, uh, you're going to do a gauge linearity and bias, bias study. Or if you're looking for precision, well, first thing you say, what's the method of testing parts? Uh, is it a non-destructive method, method where we, you know, we maintain the sample and we can keep using it over and over again? In that case, we use a gauge and RR, uh, gauge and RR study crossed, uh, what's called a cross study. Now, if it's uh, destructive, uh, you know, where we, the, where we destroy the, the, uh, the, the, the sample, uh, for instance, like an assay test where we dissolve a, a tablet and it's gone, uh, we would use a different form of gauge R&R called the nested. Uh, and uh, you'll understand that in a second. So gauge R&R crossed. This is a gauge study where every part is measured by every person. So they just pass them on. Usually this is a randomized, so you don't know that you're doing the same one over and over again. Uh, you say, okay, I got a three on that one. I'll just write down three. Uh, you don't want that to happen. So, uh, but they have to be able to measure the same part over and over again. And I call it crossed because the, uh, or I use the, the way I remember it is crossed crosses between the different uh, operators. Then nested, not all the samples can be tested multiple times. So for samples that undergo destructive testing and are tested by only one analyst at, at, at one time, a mini tab suggests using the nested option. And by nested, uh, what we do is we create a nest, uh, that's like a, a bird's nest of eggs. Uh, we make, make a nest of samples and say, okay, these are all sample one, and these guys over here are all sample two. So we may have uh, nine samples in, in one nest, and each person tests three of them. And we consider all those to be equal. So that would be a nest of, of samples. Now, gauge on our measurement system resolution. There's a rule of 10 that says the resolution of your gauge should be able to fit at least 10 times into the process variability that you are measuring itself. Minitab calls resolution a number of distinct categories. So when you see the output in the session window from Minitab, you'll, you won't find uh, the, the resolution listed anywhere. But it'll say number of distinct categories. And that is equal to the same thing. So if we look at the process variation for, from part to part, and we break it up into 10, we would like the variation from the gauge to be only about 10% of that whole spread. And as you can see, if, if the gauge is measuring different parts of the, uh, within the process variation, as it moves around, it'll be measuring different things. If we have a lot of variation in our measurement system, well, each time we measure it, the variation could be from anywhere from the, almost the, the, the mean 
of the uh, of the process variation all the way to the, uh, the lower end of the process variation but that's just the variation in the gauge itself it's not the variation of the part so once I'm getting up to about 30 percent or more of the uh, uh, of the gauge variation the, the then I, I'm having a problem uh, resolving what the actual part is so we have this 10 percent rule that tells us that the measurement system the instrument does not discriminate to 10 percent of the, uh, the part tolerance we call the precision to tolerance ratio. The measurement instrument has no feasibility to measure the, the process variation. And if the percent of the tolerance consumed by the RR does not exceed 10%, the measurement system is excellent. And here's some uh, regular rules for this. So, uh, gauge RR acceptability criteria. Uh, so, if the gauge RR uh, divided by the process variation times 100 is less than 30%, we'd call that a marginal. You know, if, if you can't get any better, that's all you can do. But you would not like this measurement system. So it should be uh, much lower than that. If it's less than 20%, that's, that's a fairly good system. And if it's less than 10%, that's an excellent system. And the same thing as a percent of tolerance so rather than process variation. So the gauge R and R divided by the tolerance times 100, same thing, minus the less than 30, less than 20, less than 10. So let's quick go over this again. As we see here, the percent of tolerance, blue, uh, it provides a quick assessment of the measurement system. If that number is greater than 30%, then you have a problem uh, with, your, uh, uh, with your system. So th then look at, this, at whether the repeatability or reproducibility percent was greater in order to determine what you need to improve. If the, per zero, if the percent is less than 10%, then you have a, an adequate measurement system. The chart below shows a very small blue bar, which means the measurement system takes a very little variation. As a matter of fact, when I went back, you can't see it on this graph, but if you, if you hover your, uh, uh, of your cursor over the bar, uh, it will, a uh, pop-up box will tell you what the actual value is, but you can't see it on here. It was less than 1% in this example. So it's a very, very good system. So the parts, the variation come from the parts as percent of tolerance is that provides the most variation, which is what, what, what you really want. So that's good. And the graph on the bottom, you see uh, uh, the, the, uh, the gauge r and repeatability is way over f uh, f uh, 5%, 50, I'm sorry, 50%. So it's close to maybe at 60%. So this thing is every time you measure it, it's either measuring one half of the variation or the other half of the variation. Uh, who, who knows what, what it's getting. By the way, uh, and, and this is bad, by the way, you'll notice that the, uh, the, the values can add up to more than 100%. And this is because it's, it's, me it's measuring uh, uh, proportions, not per percentages, actually. Now, again, in an ideal chart, the variation of the parts should be large. Uh, you know, they, they should move around in comparison to the variation of the measurements uh, around the mean for each part. So what you'll see is the individual points spread out from your shoulder range sample, and, and, and then it means that the measurement system is having a hard time picking up where the variation is coming from the part or the measurement system itself. So this is good here, where all the data points are spot on uh, an average, and the next one moves and moves, and it's always moving around. You see very, very good results here. And this is bad. As you see, this, the dispersion or the spread of the data keeps it starts opening up, and it's overlapping the, where the, the range is for the other samples. Uh, we're not really being able to tell uh, very well uh, what, the, what the movement is uh, of, of the part. As you, as you see, for, for batch one, I could get a higher result, which, it, which the average is lower than batch two. But at the top end, uh, you see a high result there, and I could have gotten that. And uh, for batch two, uh, I could have gotten one of the low ends. So I could have reported batch two is lower than batch one. This is not what you want. That's bad. Operator sample interaction. If you're looking for parallel lines, uh, this is what you want. It means there is no interactions. Uh, interactions would mean that certain parts were measured differently with either more or less variation by certain operators. This is another sign of a poor measurement system. So here, when all the parts are, all the, all the results are uh, for each of the operators on top of each other, that's very good. When they are not on top of each other and they're moving all over the place, they, can't, they don't repeat each other, they don't reproduce each other, that is bad. This is an easy chart to pick, pick apart. And then the overall operator, uh, average by operator, uh, the measurements by operator, it, it, you should see a very, very similar, if you're using a box and whisker plot or if you're using the individual uh, point plot, you can pick either one in Minitab. Uh, you should see that the box and whiskers should look exactly the same, or the individual points should look exactly the same, and that that, that line connecting all the averages should be a straight line ac across. That's good. 
then again, if the box and whisker plots don't look the same, which we have here, and the averages are moving around, uh, that's bad. Because again, this is the aggregate of their results. Uh, and as an aggregate, they should really match each other up if, if these guys are agreeing with each other. And in this case, the aggregates don't match up. On average, they don't get the same results. And the R chart. The next chart, the R chart shows a repeatability and producibility variation. And uh, up on top, all that's within, that's good. And here we see uh, at least one point is, is out. That's bad. And the X bar chart. Uh, again, all as I mentioned before, you you really can't see this. Uh, they have to uh, these uh, the upper control limit and lower control limit were actually be, had to be tweezed apart and turn on mini tabs so you can actually read them because the lines are so close together. <coughs> but the uh, upper and lower control limits and the average actually lie on top of each other. Very 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 tight <coughs> variation here, <coughs> around 69 70 percent. However, all the data points are moving all around for for Curly, Larry, and Mo. And uh, they, they, we can easily tell the difference um, uh, between the, uh, the, the, the variation of the product itself and the variation of the system. Very, very good. And then the, the chart below, the export chart by operator, shows that a lot of the data is within the variation of the measurement system itself. It's falling within those control limits for the measurement system, and that is not a good thing. Only, only four or five data points are outside, six data points are outside. Uh, the, uh, uh, the control limits. Now, corrective actions for gauge R and R studies. Now, once you've got these things, okay, you might be able, to, you should be able to figure out where your problems are coming from. So, finding the sources of the error is only the first step. Uh, what do you do when you find the sources? The sources you have to eliminate them. So, below are some suggestions for actions to take upon finding the sources. Repeatability. Repeatability indicates a problem with the measurement instrument or an error on the part of the analyst uh, operator. The measurement instrument may need maintenance. There may be something wrong about the instrument. It would be, be very bad to go out into a Six Sigma project and start a project with an instrument that's not working properly. There may be a source of noise affecting the measurement system, so find out, see if there's any, anything happening with that. Maybe it's plugged into a, uh, you know, a, 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 a not a pure power supply or something like that, and it's, and it's something with a lot of noise on it that's uh, causing more variation in it. Uh, try to identify which samples or parts the anal analyst operator may have made a mistake on and have them run them again. In fact, as they pointed out, that I think it was uh, Curly or Larry had made a mistake on lot three. So, okay, uh, once we run that over again and, and add that data in and substitute it, then everything will change on the charts. Reproducibility indicates a problem with the analysts or operators. This is almost always a training issue or, or basic competency issue on the part of the, um, of the uh, analyst. As we saw, Mo was uh, directionally lower. There's something biased in the way he's doing. He's doing something wrong. Uh, and his precision is very good. Whatever he's doing wrong, he's doing it wrong all the, way, the same time all the time. So he's got, he's got re good reproducibility of himself, but he can't reproduce the other, uh, other analysts. So identify the analysts or operators whose data differ from the other analysts and, or operators and determine if there's a bias with this analyst or operator and try to identify how it's caused. And then retrain and certify the analysts or operators. Once they've been trained and certified, the reproducibility value should go down. Should. Absolutely. Now attribute gauge and R. <coughs> gauge R and R. Normally gauge R and R analysis requires responses to be quantitative and we use continuous data. That's the, the, the most common uh, a use for it uh, in, in, uh, in, in a pharmaceutical situation, but when you get into services and other areas or into, into other types of operations, you'll be probably collecting a lot of attribute data. Uh, so you may uh, collect uh, some, some qualitative things for, let's say, let's say you're looking at the color of course here. People are complaining about it looks, doesn't look like a cherry or something like that. And maybe you're going to uh, rate the color of cough syrup so batches uh, on a base scale of 1 to 10. So you've got a, an ordinal scale there. Uh, or let's say uh, in an adverse event uh, 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 switchboard, scoring of nurses call center for accuracy of information. So you're going to you're going to keep track of how well they're providing information or something like that uh, to the public. So attribute gauge R and R assess a, a measurement system for quanti qualitative responses. Attribute gauge R and R uses two different statistics, kappa and Kendall's coefficient of concordance. These statistics depend on whether they are ordinal or nominal. So here we look at uh, some attribute data. Uh, Biologics bio, Biofilling Facility wishes to examine the reliability of visual inspection by operators for particulate matter. Uh, three operators inspect 100 known vials three times, 
and the results except re reject are recorded. Okay. Analysts one and three had trouble with some samples. So as you see, uh, analyst uh, analyst one uh, did uh, sample number five three times. He accepted it, rejected it once, and rejected it twice. Uh, for three, he accepted it and rejected it and accepted it. Uh, for for analyst three, uh, for analyst one on number fourteen, he accepted, rejected, and rejected. Uh, uh, number 14. So he didn't r repeat himself there. And all the analysts misvalued these samples. For instance, for number 13, all the analysts accepted it, but the true value is reject. And the same thing for 20. Uh, everyone accepted it, but really was a reject. They missed it. So here's the output, which is different from the gauge R and R that you, what we see for continuous data. So we, uh, we do the assessment uh, within appraisers and appraisers versus the standard. So you show the repeatability of the operators as a percent score. So the blue dot is the actual score, and the X indicates the 95 uh, confidence uh, intervals, uh, since 20 is a small number of samples for attribute data. Uh, that We only use 20 in this example, though it said 100. And then uh, also the appraiser shows the performance of the operators against the known values. For example, well, operators who agree with themselves 100% of the time uh, he or she only agreed with the known values 90% of the time. And then assessment agree uh, agreement. All right. Uh, low within appraiser scores indicate that an operator may need help, such as improved lighting conditions or maybe just needs a new pair of glasses. And also low appraiser or standard scores indicates the operator may need additional training what constitutes a rejected vial since they missed several of them. So this is uh, the appraiser versus standard uh, only got 70% of them. So 30 of the 30 percent of them he missed or she missed. So they don't seem to know you know accurately what is a rejected vial versus an, an acceptable vial. So again, uh, the indication for retraining.